Hello, good evening. Uh, thank you for joining us for this webinar discussion entitled The Billum, How Do You Carry Your Things? which accompanies an exhibition of the same name on view in Brooks Hall on UVA grounds, um, just across from the corner. Before we go any further, uh, I want to open this event by acknowledging that the University of Virginia sits on the territory and homelands of the Monacan Indian nation, and ask that you join me in paying respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. Since some of you might be joining us from outside Monacan territory, I want to also acknowledge other indigenous nations on whose homelands we collectively live and work. I'm Catherine Walden. I'm the administrator of the Mellon Indigenous Arts Program at UVA. And I'm delighted to introduce um, Lise Dobrin, Associate Professor of Anthropology at UVA. Lise is an expert in the language and culture of Arapesh peoples in Papua New Guinea. And this exhibition project about which she'll be talking tonight grew out of a class that she developed on Melanesian material culture when she was an indigenous arts um, faculty fellow in academic year 2019 to 2020. One of the goals of the Mellon Indigenous Arts Program is to give faculty the opportunity to develop new courses with indigenous content to um, broaden and enrich UVA's course offerings. Lisa's class called Curating Culture, Collection, Preservation and Display as Cultural Forms and this exhibition that resulted from that class are really excellent examples of the kinds of um, rich and direct learning experiences that we wish to support and continue at UVA in Indigenous arts and more broadly in Indigenous studies. It's uh, especially exciting that Lise is joined here today um, by three of her undergraduate students, uh, Meme Shu, Louise Brosnan, and Ellie Perkins, who co-curated the exhibition. After Professor Dobrin gives her presentation, Meme, Ellie, and Louise will speak a bit about their experiences as co-curators. We'll also have some time for questions at the end of the program. And uh, let me say quickly that we have disabled the chat function, but if you'd like to ask a question, please use the Q&A function uh, at the bottom of the screen. Um, so um, with that, um, Professor Dobrin and Louise and Ellie, would you like to join me here? Hi, welcome. <laughs> Okay, Lise, I will turn this over to you. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen, sharing my email. <clears throat> All right, I am thrilled to have this chance to share with you about the exhibit of New Guinea net bags or billums that my students and I just finished mounting in Brooks Hall. And as you'll learn in the next half hour or so, the exhibit grows out of many years of thinking and relationship building, and it almost got scuttled by the pandemic. So we are delighted that it is finally up. So first I wanna say you should go see it. It's not in a regular exhibit space. It's in Brooks Hall, across from Bank of America on the corner um, in Charlottesville. One of the things that my students and I studied in preparing for the exhibit was how Brooks was originally built in the 1870s to be a natural history museum. So it's cool for us to be using it again for that purpose, but we hope now in a more enlightened way. Um, I wanna start with some thank yous to the people and organizations that made the exhibit possible. First and foremost, thanks are due to my friends and relations in Papua New Guinea, especially the people of Wautogic Village and the Sonin family. They made and gave us so many billums, beautiful billums. Um, they have shared their lives with me and my family and really they gave me my career. The Mellon Indigenous Arts Program and the Clay Endowment um, supported the, how, the course that led to the exhibit. Um, and Mellon Program Administrator Catherine Walden has provided wonderful logistical support, including hosting this webinar. Um, my colleagues in the Fralin um, <clears throat> and Klugi Roo 
gave us just ridiculous levels of practical and moral support, I can really say this would not have happened without them. The UVA, UVA Anthropology Department uh, let us use Brooks Hall um, and mess up the walls, even though they had just been refinished. Uh, Co Sweet and Molly Angevine took beautiful photos, some of which you are already enjoying. Um, my anthropology colleague, Jeff Hantman, um, taught us about Brooks Hall. My daughter, Hannah Bashkow, designed the gorgeous exhibit lettering and showed up on my behalf in the class on the very first day with an armful of billums because I was too sick to go. Do you guys remember that? Um, so thank you to Hannah. And above all, thanks to my husband and constant teacher, Ira Bashkow. Um, he's also a UVA anthropology professor, and he is the one who first helped me understand New Guinea culture when I was a grad student preparing for field work. And what I learned from him is the only reason that I was able to meet by my Papua New Guinean interlocutors anywhere near where they were at and bring them something of value in return for all that they give me. So thank you, Ira, I know you're here. And the students, um, when the pandemic, pandemic hit, things were not looking so good for putting on a physical exhibit. Um, but then starting in the fall, some of us thought, well, maybe we can do this. So special thanks um, to those who uh, kept coming out, even though the course was long over. Um, uh, and that includes Elise Cooper, Abby Duff, Alexandra Saul, Maggie Harris, Lauren Parker, and of course, Maymay, Ellie, and Louise, um, who are also speaking today. So I, what I wanna try to do um, is answer these three questions. What are bilums? How did my closets get so full of them? And why would an ex exhibit about bilums be interesting to go see? The first thing you need to know is that bilums are made by Melanesian people in a place called Papua New Guinea. It's the eastern half of a huge island in the Pacific that was colonized and decolonized relatively late. Papua New Guinean's colonial experience involved resource extraction more than um, occupation or settlement by Europeans. Um, so people today still mostly live on their own lands and grow a lot of their own food. Culturally, they share an emphasis on exchange or giving and receiving things as a way of making relationships. And among the things they give and receive are bilums or net bags like this one. They're traditionally made out of twine that comes from tree bark or other natural sources though now people also use um, store-bought yarn and other manufactured materials like fishing wire. The strings form one continuous loop with no knots, so they're strong and expandable. And they're strongly associated with women. These photos are from Arapesh country on the New Guinea North Coast. They were taken by the anthropologist Rayo Fortune in the early 1930s. On the left, you see a woman working on a bilum with the same characteristic hand movement pulling the threads through that you would see today. On the right, you see a woman carrying a heavy full bilum expanded with garden produce, one of the things that they carry. And bilums are used to put babies in. Here's my sister-in-law, Fidel Masonen, carrying her little boy during his nap. You can see that when women carry heavy things in billums, they do so from the head. If you look carefully at this image, you'll see she's also carrying a smaller billum on her left arm. And that's probably got her betel nut, her cigarettes, that kind of stuff, her kind of little things, like we would carry a purse. Now, the reason that I have many billums is that I have many relationships with Papua and New Guinea women. I first went to the country as a graduate student in the late 1990s to study an Arapesh language. And I tried to be generous with people and I took a real interest in their lives, which they really appreciated and wanted to reciprocate. So here you see my graduate student, Ida Hoquist, 
being shown how to properly harvest taro root by my sister-in-law, Dorcas. Um, and then on the right, you see Dorcas's husband, Trophy, helping me load a billum full of taro, like what Ida had just uh, harvested, onto my head to carry back to the village. And then when we got back to the village, here you see me, Ida, and my daughter, Hannah, arriving with our garden pro produce harvest on our heads in the bilums. And uh, Trophy is very proud of this because we are doing what they do instead of telling them to do what we do. And here is just an, another image of me on the same trip uh, in 2017. Um, carrying my notebook and my water bottle like daily items in a bilum <clears throat> while being shown a special way of making sago, a kind of food starch that people eat. Um, the point is that being there with people um, and taking an interest in their lives, I made a lot of friends. So for example, one day when I was in town, um, I ran into one of my aunties, Angela, and uh, two of her kids, my cousins, they knew I was around and they were actually looking for me. Why? Because they wanted to give me this special bag kind of variation on the Billum theme that features a Jewish menorah. Um, they thought I would like it because they know that I'm Jewish and they themselves and their family had recently joined a Messianic church. As a result of all of this friendship making, I ended up with a lot of billums. My husband also has a lot of billums because he's an anthropologist who works in New Guinea. Um, we use some, but we can't use this many. So this was my home office floor when we got sent home last spring um, and we were planning the exhibit remotely. So I had all the billums out. And since it was the pandemic, we also had to get a puppy and he liked the billums too. All right, this storyline intersects with another one that goes back to 2015. I had invited my village father, Jacob Sonen, to UVA to help me with some research and to serve as the native speaker expert in a linguistics class that I was teaching. Um, and here's my husband, Ira, in the picture also. So while he was here, um, we got a chance um, we went with Carrie Douglas when she was teaching an anthropology of art course. And we got a chance to go to the Millmont storage facility of the Freyland um, with her class and found that there were dozens of items from New Guinea that were stored away there just on shelves and understudied. So when the Mellon Indigenous Arts Program began to offer fellowships, it seemed like the perfect chance to bring some attention to the things in my closet and the things in the Freelands closet. And that's how the curating culture course that led to the exhibit came about. The students and I went into the Freyland and um, studied the objects. Here are two of the students in the class selecting their objects for study. Um, and then we dedicated ourselves to finding a way to present the billums um, so that viewers in Charlottesville could admire them and understand them, which meant they would have to learn about Papua New Guinea, they would have to learn about exchange, and we would have to learn about exhibit making. <clears throat> Fortunately, we had amazing guides. So here's uh, one fun example. It was the first week that we uh, got, had to go back to class after spring break last year, right? So that was when we were starting to have things online instead of in person. And our first class back was supposed to be a field trip to the Kluge Room Museum to see the exhibit of, um, Abor Aboriginal Australian women's uh, weaving, and we were unable to go. So we were fortunate enough to be given a personally guided virtual tour. Um, and during the tour, Henry Skerritt said something that like really stuck in my mind. He said, when people first come in, before they know anything, 
it's good to have something visually striking to catch their eye. And then they'll want to learn. So I had just been reading an article by an anthropologist, Bob Foster, um, and he was analyzing some exhibits of New, New Guinea material culture from years ago at the Buffalo Museum of Science. And it included this amazing image on the left of a display of New Guinea lime spatulas. And lime spatulas, what are those? They're like kind of a, imagine like a butter knife that you stick down into some lime powder and then, and then you can like put it in your mouth. Okay, that's enough to know. Um, well, this exhibit of lime spatulas had been created in the style of a department store window, which apparently was like a thing that people did at that time. Anyway, I loved it so much, I couldn't believe it was possible. And that was the inspiration for the billum wheels that we made for either end of um, Brooks Hall and that you've seen on the poster. So um, we were inspired by that as well as by this cheese. <laughs> um, it wasn't until the fall that we were able to meet in person again, but when we did, the first step was to make the billum wheels. Um, and so let's see, I think I'm gonna turn it over now to Mene, who's going to talk a little bit about a different topic. Thank you, Lise. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Mei Mei Xu, and I am a fourth year in the College of Arts and Sciences. I am double majoring in cognitive science and anthropology. Um, and I originally took um, Lisa's class last spring because I was really interested to get to know more about the intersection of um, museum work and anthropology. So now I'm going to talk about more of the innovation and adaptability of um, the billums that we have. So this first um, billum, our class likes to call this the power line billum because of the characteristic cross motif that you can see patterned across the bag. Um, so this is a religious cross design, which is directly inspired from traditional Christian iconography, which is also a result of um, missionary activity in Papua New Guinea. So we really wanted to showcase this billum because um, like from the physicality of it, you can kind of see this play of like religious and cultural context mixed with more of like the traditional craft work. So this billum here, we like to call the sweater billum because the material is actually made from recoiling and reusing the yarn material from an old sweater. Um, and so for this specific one, there's also this mix of like the traditional billum making craft with more contemporary materials. And also from both of these billums, um, you can notice the tape measure that we have in the picture as well. And this was a result of our class having to move to a virtual platform. Um, and so we needed to have uh, more of like a context of, we needed to deal with like the process of working from on a virtual platform with um, like physical logistics of, you know, how big the billums were and everything like that. So this next picture is a picture of Grace, um, Lisa's sister-in-law. And as you can see, this is very clearly a picture taken from Facebook of Grace in her car with her sunglasses and all. And at the very back, you can see her billum just peeping out from her passenger seat. So in general for our exhibit, we also have uh, many similar pictures of billums being casually used and also the candid appearance of them in the backgrounds of images of people, um, especially from Lisa's village. And we wanted to add pictures of people in particular to really frame and normalize um, the usage of billums in a more contemporary way to show that billum usage is still around today. And we also focused on showcasing pictures of individuals that Lisa knows well to create a like an almost like human humanistic atmosphere around these films, not only as just exhibition objects, but also as used, loved and valued bags. And so with this particular image of Grace, given the context of this being a Facebook photo of her being in her car, taking what is presumably a selfie and just having her billum in the background, we really thought this image speaks to the naturalness of having billums as a casual and 
um, like normal part of contemporary Melanesian culture, which also showcases how bilums continue to be a part of everyday importance for the people. Thanks, Amy. Louise? Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm a third year student in the College of Arts and Sciences. I am a global development and art history double major, and I was specifically drawn to this class as a way to gain knowledge about curation and material culture. Um, the class ended up being a perfect bridge between my global cultural studies and my interest in the arts. Um, I'm interested in museum work as a career path, and this class also fit well into some larger themes I have been pursuing personally, specifically the role of touch and tactility in the museum. Um, I most recently took a class on 3D models, digital scanning, and archiving for museums this past fall, and had the chance to learn even more about the application of tactility in an exhibition setting, and then relate it back to the Abilum exhibition as we were continuing work at the same time. So the class that I most recently took was out of the art history and archaeology departments, and that was taught by Janet Dunkelbarger. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit briefly about the history of tactility museums. Um, museum visitors have historically interacted with collections in tactile ways, going all the way back to the early 18th century. This practice had almost completely stopped. And then by the mid 19th century, the, the practice um, completely died out. So people were no longer allowed to touch items. And then scholars attribute this change to several factors, including the visual nature of capitalism, emphasis on looking in advertisement, um, modern notions of observation came into play, as well as um, some myths of associating touching with the primitive. So today, um, the ability to touch in a display setting is usually seen as a great privilege and not a right. But this is changing in certain scenarios um, where touch can aid in learning, especially with models and replicas, but in these instances, um, the question of authenticity often enters the discussion. And so the question becomes, how important is touching the original object to the experience? And that is one thing that made working on this project so incredibly unique, um, is we could use the authentic original objects in our exhibition, and we could make them available for touching. So because of the very specific nature of this collection, which Professor Dobrin has already discussed, um, these objects are meant in the collection to be touched and interacted with. Tactility surrounds the works, as many of the traditional styles are handcrafted, um, with the specific freedom of this being this personal collection. With the endorsement of public exploration, we could design certain aspects of the space with this in mind. For example, um, each of the bags features a bag tag with the name of the gift, um, who gifted it when available, and the regional location of the bags. These tags are meant to be flipped and manipulated by our visitors. Another beautiful thing about working from this collection is that the bags were, again, gifted to Professor David Dobrin with the explicit intent of use, including typical wear and tear, so the fear of degradation by touching was not a main concern for this project. As Professor Dobrin mentioned, these are items of social gift exchange and mark a relationship between the giver and the receiver. They were not expropriated. They came here by honest exchange to her as gifts from her family members. Um, this incredibly unique situation allowed us to be free of the fear of handling the bags, both as we learned about them and as we planned out the exhibition. So another feature of the exhibition is we suspended each bag from a peg that stands out from the wall. This way the bags can be removed by our visitors um, and then rehung on the pegs with ease. Um, you can investigate their weight and their texture. While manipulating the bilums, the visitor takes on power in the exhibition space. Unlike in a traditional display setting, the visitor to our exhibit retains the ability to manipulate the material culture as they please and focus on areas they're interested in. Because we're always taught to look with our eyes and not our hands, um, sort of in a display setting, um, we chose to include small directive cards or prompts 
that encourage our visitors to try lifting or peering inside of the belums in the exhibit with a real emphasis on materiality and tactility um, as central to this project. And we hope that some of you may be able to experience them in person yourself. Thank you so much, Louise. Ellie? Hi, um, thank you everyone for coming out. This is really exciting for us. Um, and it just means a lot that you all would come out and listen to us. Um, and I also hope you get a chance to go and visit the exhibit in Brooks Hall. Um, I'm, my name is Ellie, as Professor Dobern said, I am a fourth year majoring in anthropology. Um, and I took this class because a year, let's see, a semester before I took this class, I had taken language and culture with Professor Dobrin, and I enjoyed it. And I also have previously taken um, a, an anthropology course about museums. And so I was really excited to kind of uh, learn what I applied, apply what I had learned and learned in that course to this course and actually go through the process of curating an exhibit. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, why we as students and why Professor Dobrin, why we all gave our time um, during a pandemic when the course had ended uh, like almost a year ago now um, and a little bit about the exhibit. So this picture right here, I think it's November 21st. And that was the first time we were able to see each other in person as a group um, since we got sent home in what was it, March? Um, so that was really special because in person things were just so different. Um, and that was when we could begin actually like working on the exhibit. Um, Professor Dobrin and her husband, Professor Bashkow were like kind enough to um, invite us to their house to work on these billum wheels like we talked about before. And something I found funny was that a few students showed up with sticks in, in billums. And I, I didn't know about this. And Professor Dobrin had instructed a few people to go on like nature walks or hikes with some billums to find sticks that like would match the size of the billums so that when the billums were like stretched out, the sticks would fill them. Um, and they said that that was like one of the most fun things that they had done in a long time. Um, and that leads me to my next slide where I want to talk kind of about the effects of, um, the pandemic on the class and like why we stuck around. Um, I mentioned that going on the nature walk was like some of the most fun people had had in a while. And I think one of the reasons I was drawn to continue participating is that most of my classes are virtual. So I don't really get much interaction with my peers or like social interaction, um, and I think that this was a really safe thing to do. Brooks Hall is such a massive building. It's really old, but it's just been renovated. So it's really nice. And you can just toss open the windows. It was very spacious, airy and safe. And it felt like a very positive, creative thing to do during such a negative time. Um, and I really looked forward to coming and working on the exhibit every week, being able to see people um, and just follow through with the project. We, had, we did a lot of fun things that we wouldn't have done otherwise. Um, one of the classmates named Abby showed us how to use her mom's like portable laminating machine, which was really cool and I want one now. Um, some of us went on nature, I didn't go on a nature walk, but some of the class went on nature walks um, and a lot of us scavenged our homes um, for items. Like one peer brought in her baby dolls, Professor Dobrin, um, talk to neighbors to find like an empty cigarette pack to put in the billum. I uh, had my parents locate all of our old cell phones, which I don't know why we have, but we do. Um, and so it was really just an interesting kind of fun activity. Um, and like I said, it was just something to look forward to doing every week. Um, and we had, you know, every week we had just progress made, whether it was small or big, like when this lettering was done. Um, it was, I wasn't there for that task. I heard it was pretty, pretty crazy, but it looks beautiful. Um, and so seeing progress every week was just really uplifting during such a kind of negative time. Um, and then lastly, I just, it's really impressive. So we had, I think seven people, seven classmates, and then Professor Dobrin um, consistently coming and working on it. I don't think we had the same group any time, um, which shows how like busy people are. Um, with things, but that was like about half of the class. Um, and I think only 11 people 
because of graduation and some people aren't living in Charlottesville right now could have come. So the majority of people could who could have worked on the exhibit did. Um, and that just shows you like how, how great and how much fun we had in the spring planning it. And um, like what Louise was stressing about the materiality of things, this really could not have been a virtual exhibit. And that's one of the reasons for me why we just really wanted to go through with this um, and carry it out. You know, there are things you can feel in person, like there's an animal called the cuscus that has really soft fur and that's looped into some of the billums and you can't get that online. Um, so yeah, we had a blast doing it. Um, yeah. Thank you, Ellie. Well, I think that's what we have for you and we would love to have questions if there are any questions. And um, here's Eno all grown up. He's been the mascot of our little uh, project. And um, thank you all for coming and listening. And I hope you'll go see the exhibit. Yeah, Lise, so there's some questions for you in the Q&A. Um, I'm happy to read them out. Um, so the first one is, do the men use the bilums as well? How did you get interested in Papua New Guinea? Okay, wow, well, those are uh, big <laughs> questions. So yes, men do carry bilums, um, but they carry them differently. So men carry from the shoulder. So a man will have like, you know, his like kind of bag um, of stuff that he'll carry, uh, smokes, um, you know, stuff like that, a hand knife, things like that. Um, whereas the idea, actually the word bilum, so that's from the language talk pizin, and I won't tell you the Arapesh word, it's not very pronounceable, but um, it is also the word for uterus. And um, so that's why I was saying that bilums are very strongly associated with women, like um, carrying heavy things, strangely enough, is thought to be women's work. Um, so yeah, and that's why we have a whole kind of section of the exhibit on carrying because carrying is actually an elaborated concept in New Guinea and a lot of New Guinea languages have different words for carry depending on what you're carrying or how you're carrying it in Arapesh to carry from the head and to carry from the shoulder are different verbs. So yeah, we also have in the, in the exhibit a little um, child's billum. So another way people wear their billums is sometimes over the neck and just in front of them, you can kind of reach in and grab whatever you want. And little kids will carry like, if, they, if they've got a slingshot, they'll carry their little stones for slingshotting, um, for slingshotting uh, birds or whatever. Um, using their, uh, you know, getting the stones out of there. Okay, what was the other question? The second question was, how did you get interested in Papua New Guinea? How did I get interested in Papua New Guinea? I got interested in the Arapesh language. I was studying linguistics and, um, and I just found this language that did some very interesting things. Um, so, Every noun has a gender in Arapesh. And the way you know its gender is by its final consonant. And um, so, and then you, you get like agreement with verbs and um, adjectives and things like that by matching that final consonant. So it's just this really cool interpenetration of sound system and grammar. So that's actually how I got interested in New Guinea. <laughs> You are actually getting a lot of questions here. Oh dear, okay. <laughs> no, it's great. Um, and a couple of people, if I can jump in, a couple of people have asked, um, um, how are you related to the people that you mentioned? Um, and uh, this, let's see what the other one. Um, yeah, can Professor Dobrin talk about her family in Papua New Guinea and how you're invited in as a family member? So we've got several people interested in that kind of um, yeah. interaction. I, I love that question. It's the most important thing. So people in Papua New Guinea, you know, they understand themselves as sort of a, a node in a network. And that network is really their family. So imagine like a family tree that ramifies like hugely out. And so um, I, you know, some when I came to the village that I wanted to work in, 
I was guided there by a missionary who had been living in the area for a long time. And he suggested that I might live there. I might live in this house. And the family who owned that house said, okay. And that was Jacob, the father. And so his mother, Scola, who made a bill of them that features in the exhibit, um, became my mother. And, you know, in, in a way, if I didn't have them, I wouldn't know where I was anywhere because you have to figure out who you are to know how you relate to anybody else. And so I know who my cousins are and who my siblings are and who my aunties are because I have a place in a fan. I have a node in that family tree and they're not joking around. I mean, you really adoption. They don't care that they're black and I'm white. They're like, we take care of you. You are our daughter. And, um, and that has, you know, implications in both directions. I have to help them and can, you know, in an ongoing way, and they have to help me in an ongoing way. Um, so, and then like the people that Ida and Hannah and I, when we were carrying those heavy things back from the garden, okay, uh, that's my husband's people. So my husband is adopted into a whole different area. And so his family are my in-laws. So it just keeps going like that. If my husband weren't, so my husband is an in-law in my village, I'm an in-law in their village. I could talk about that all day, I love that. I'm glad people are interested. We have um, also a lot of questions about like the physicality of the billums and like um, specific, I guess, attributes of them. Um, one is about the nature in which they're made. Someone wants to know how are they, how are colors changed when making a pattern if there are no knots? You know, the making of the billums is not the strong suit of our exhibit. And the reason is that we don't have a lot of knowledge about that. I didn't work on ex the, I didn't make billums when I was there. Um, my daughter made billums and she could answer that question perhaps. But um, yeah, one thing I know that they do is that they roll twine. So imagine if you had three strands of yarn, you would actually roll them together to make a tight, strong, like twine. And so if you wanna go from like red to white, I think you could roll in, start rolling in white, and then it would become white. I'm guessing that that's um, how that works about the color changes. And then we also have, it looks like two questions about um, the significance and uh, of colors. So someone wants to know, do the colors have significance? For example, in the, um, I think it's the Powelline vellum, do the red and bluish purple colors have any significance? And then um, Professor Hantman wants to know if the cross imagery is um, seen in only colonial and missionary time or is it seen before that? So those are two, kind of about the similar bellums. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to answer about the power line first. So I think the power line has actually got two meanings. One of them is the Christian meaning. The other one is like light poles like you see in town for you know stringing wires. So um yeah, I don't think that that exact that design is something that people would have made before. I don't know but I think that it's innovative. Um, and the colors, so I would say the colors don't have meaning in the way that we think of color symbology, but they do have associations. So for example, it, where I come from, where I locate through my fam, adopted family in New Guinea, they have red, white, and blue billums. And the red, you know, until you could buy yarn in stores, the red and the blue didn't quite look the same as ours, you know, our kind of prototypical uh, colors for the ideas of those colors. But they were trying, they would dye them to things that look kind of blue and kind of red. Okay, that style gets associated with that place. So and anytime anybody sees it, they say, oh, you got your billum from these people. So I would say that the colors don't have meaning as colors, but their combinations or their designs have social meaning as associated with the people who make them. 
Did I answer all the questions? And I don't, I don't know if you saw, but your daughter just wrote and said, yes, you can sort of um, splice the colors directly together. So. Yeah, that's what I, that's what I kind of imagined. And there's cool new ways of like, well, you'll have to go and see. There's cool new ways of like um, having colors fade into and out of, you know, like they'll fade into white and then fade into another color. That's new. That's, that's sort of, you know, Cool new styles. People like making cool new styles. Um, one uh, question we got was, have you ever, you said you received the villains as gifts. Are they ever sold? And this is something we definitely talked about in class um, and then in our making of the exhibit, um, sort of to the contempor contemporaneousness of the villains point. Um, there are some that are machine made now. And so those um, can be sold for a profit. And we did mention this in the context of them being women made and women selling them and how that can become a point of income for women. Yes, you're right. Um, and people do sell them in markets. Um, actually, it's uh, my husband and I were just talking about this the other night. Um, they're quite expensive. They're quite expensive. And I think that's a recognition of the labor that goes into them. You know, so women make them, women sell them, and that means they get the money. And there's not a lot of things that are like that. So, you know, a lot of the time when we talk about, you know, big exchange displays in New Guinea, it's all sort of things men are doing. And it's so nice that these are, you know, this is a domain that women control economically, artistically. Does anybody have questions for the students? Well, actually, one very practical question. Um, what are the hours and days at Brook Hall? <laughs> and how long is this exhibition going to be up for? Um, a couple of people have asked that. So Great, yeah. So um, the building is locked at night and on the weekends. So if you came between 9 and 5, you'd be safe for getting in. Um, how long is the exhibit going to be up? <laughs> I am I am going to take a stab and say it will be up through the end of 2021, at least. Mm -hmm. So you've got time. There's yeah. not a lot of competition for the display space because anything that goes up there is just on the walls in a building that's unlocked. So, you know, if most people who have something to display want to protect it. We're taking a risk here, but we think it's worth it. Any other questions that the students want to take? Just looking through the list here. Yeah, um, there was another one. Someone asked what happens when things are so small that they could fall out of the billums, such as coins or money? Are there many billums? And so, with coins or money, to my understanding, um, that would just be in a smaller either wallet sort of coin purse, and then that would be in the billum. Um, as a wider, you would it functions sort of like a bigger purse or like satchel. Um, but there are many billums. Um, we do have a baby billum, um, which is a children's size billum um, in our exhibition. It has a little shell hanging from it. It's very beautiful. Um, and so there are smaller ones that people carry. Um, and especially children. Well, and this question could actually be for all of you. Um, Lauren Mopin says, if there's time, I'd love to hear which billum is each of your favorites and why. <laughs> I wanna, while, they're thinking, while they're thinking about that, I'm gonna say something about um, the things that could fall out. Yes, things fall mm -hmm. out, little tiny things fall out. And the worst thing that falls out is pens or pencils. So if you are a linguist like me or an anthropologist, you always want to have a pen or a pencil. And um, you have to be very careful because you have to get a tight weave billum to keep it in. Otherwise they fall out. So 
that's a it's a real practical problem that I have had to deal with, not just a kind of I don't know general curiosity. Anybody want to offer their favorite film? Or just one that comes to mind that they can tell the story of? Oh, I was going to say, I think my favorite films in the exhibit are some of the larger, um, more colorful ones that are made out of fishing line, plastic fishing, because as, again, this practice has evolved um, with time, um, new materials have become incorporated into how they're woven. So that allowed sort of a greater saturation of color to enter um, when they're not, not being woven out of this bark, um, but maintain that traditional sort of looping style. Um, so I really love the vibrancy of those and they're quite large. So if you get a chance to go in there and pick them up, they're almost as big as I am because I am very small. <laughs> they're also great for beach bags. Yeah. Um, somebody asked, and I can't actually find the question now, but somebody asked, how many billons would a, an a, a ordinary woman in Papua New Guinea have? In their, you know, you have many because you've been given many. Is that true for all of the women <laughs> in Papua New Guinea? That's such a good question, and I don't think I know the answer. I think that rather than, so we think about having something and keeping it, they think about getting something either using it or giving it. And so my guess is that women cycle through a lot of billums. If they get a really nice one, they might give it away um, rather mm -hmm. than using it. And also the most valued possessions that people have, they keep hidden. And so it's not like they're displaying them all for me to see. Like I'd mm -hmm. have to actually study something to answer that question. But it's actually a good question. I am going to study it now a little bit. <laughs> Great. <laughs> and um, part of the same question is, um, do they match them with their clothes? Like, is it, is, is it a fashion statement? Do they pick out different villains for the day, depending on what they're wearing? So in New Guinea, there's been a development of class social class. And I think that people living in urban areas or aspiring to be like women who live in urban areas and going to work might have matching outfits and billums that go with their outfits and things like that. In the village, out, the word outfit is not really apt. And so, yeah, I think that's more of as you as you move towards more metropolitan style, more um, middle class ways of life. That would be a question. Yeah, it's a very interesting, very interesting question. Something that I would never think to ask after all this time. Yeah. I think this most recent question is so important. Um, is there something that one would be expected to give in exchange for receiving a billum? And this is something we also talked about so much in the class. And I am gonna invite Professor Dobrin to tell the story. I think it was about a watch that she ended up giving um, that has stuck in my head in exchange. So, yes. So the point about a billum is that, of give, gifting billums, is that you have them and you can give them for that reason. So anything that you have, I might like, and you could give it to me. And it can be something as simple as, you know, a beetle nut, something people chew recreationally, or, um, you know, some food, or it could be something elaborate, um, including my labor. Like I could help you with a task and then you would want to give me food for having done that. And you know we have we have a certain sense of you don't just take and take and take from somebody, but yeah. So the thing about gift exchange is that um, the relationship is primary, not the object. And so the fact that somebody had something and gave it to you, I've often found I've given people like fifty kina. Kina is the unit unit of currency, and then I've given them you know five hundred kina. And the reaction is sort of the same. It's like, you gave me something. I'm so touched. Um, 
And it, it, in a way, it's like when we say, I love you, you know, we say, I love you. And it's like a really big deal. You don't just do that. They don't use their language that way. They use objects that way. So they say, I love you by giving you something. Now, for me to like show the billum and say, I got it from tappiness, my sister, you know, that would be, that would be such an acknowledgement. I think that that would be greatly appreciated. Um, yeah, but if I gave that billum away because I had it and could give it, that would also be good. And then the next person would be benefiting from it. I think I'll stop there. I have a question that I have been wondering as well here. Um, there's a question that says, what has working with the exhibit taught the students and can they use their experience for the future? <laughs> That's a question directly for the students, right? I think, um, you know, this exhibit was supposed to be, it was started spring semester last year and it was supposed to be up, correct? Like the end of the semester, that was our semester's work. Um, and having so long to work on it has taught me, I think that the exhibit would be different if we had done it in that amount of time. Um, and similarly in the class, we didn't just say, okay, this is a billum, uh, like exhibit it. You know, it, there's, there's a lot of thinking that goes into creating an exhibit, especially when it's not your, like, I don't, I didn't know about a billum before this class. So you really have to, you know, present it as it should be presented. Um, it's not, and you'll see if you go and visit it, um, how we've chosen to kind of explain the significance of it and relate it to people. But there's a lot of work that goes into um, thinking through how to do things the right way and not just your initial gut reaction um, of how you think you should do something. And I think that listening and taking the time to research things and also asking the people that you need to be asking and talking to before doing things has been a powerful lesson I've learned from this. Yeah, I think going off of that, similarly, I think I won't ever read like an exhibition text the same way again, because just realizing all the hard work that goes into like typing up what needs to be said and the editing. And it's just like, there's like someone behind that who has created um, those words. Um, and I think also like from this experience, it's just taught me a lot about like the humanness behind like all these material cultures. Cause especially with um, like the Billums and their kinship ties um, between like Lise and then like her village in Papua New Guinea, like there's a lot to be said there that can't be seen exactly like um, through the Billums themselves. So I think like, I don't know if I ever see any like material culture and like museums and stuff, I'll just really think about like, wow, there's like someone who has like created this thing and like it has it's it has like a meaning outside of like this exhibition space. Yeah, I think Mimi summed that up really well um, in terms of sort of asking yourself and myself personally every time I enter an exhibition, um, how did this come to be here and um, what hand did the person who created it play and how it's being presented here today. So sort of um, the voice of the creator and also um, the ethics of how something came um, to be presented where it did, um, how it was removed from its location and how it ended up where it is today. So I think that that's something um, everyone can be mindful of when they're thinking and kind of taking in a display. Um, and also I think this taught me a lot about sort of the constraints of the semester long time period. Um, there's so much more that can be done outside of a semester. And we really scratched the surface with our class during the class and then um, after really got into that hands-on work. So sort of just what's sticking with a project past the semester long deadline can really accomplish. Thank you. <laughs> um, we have, it's 
655 or so. Should we do another couple of questions before we I'm happy to out? I'm happy to stay and listen for a couple more. Okay. I'll let the students choose. We still have some coming in. <laughs> There are a few questions um, about your friends and family in Papua New Guinea. Um, someone wants to know, uh, how are you able to maintain relationships with people in Papua New Guinea? And then uh, someone wants to, another person wants to know if any of your relatives or people you know have offered their opinions on the exhibit. So people's opinions on the exhibit. So we just got it up and um, you know, all of our time since getting it up has been preparing for today, but I'm really excited. So one of the main ways that Papua New Guineans stay in touch with each other at a distance is through Facebook. Like that's why I'm on Facebook. Well, now I'm on for little animals and baby goats and stuff, but originally that's why I got on Facebook. And I see a lot of Papua New Guinean family and friends on Facebook. And so, um, I think I will try to make like a version of the exhibit, maybe some of the photos that Molly Angevine and Co Sweet took, maybe some picture of the pictures of us working on it. I think I will share them on Facebook and they will be seen by people in New Guinea and you know, I'll get their feedback. In general, I found that you know, people don't give you constructive criticism on Facebook. Papua New Guineans do not. Even if I ask like Oh, what does this word mean? People won't really answer. Something about more lookers, more onlookers that you can't see. I don't know, something about that is awkward. But at least it will give me a chance to make it visible to a lot of people there. And most importantly, some of my closest family are on. And even if they aren't on, they'll be able to show on their phones to others who don't have phones. So. That's what they do is they see Facebook through their phones. There's like hardly wrote, there, there's a lot of things that they don't have in New Guinea, like regular phone service and internet, but they do have cell service in a lot of places. So that's how they see it. So that's how I stay in touch. And um, also how do I keep relationships? I send money, <laughs> I ask for help. Um, yeah, that's what you do. You give and you receive. And, you know, many Papua New Guineans have gone off to move to town, you know, from their villages and they have jobs and, um, and they stay in touch with each other, you know, at a distance using these same mechanisms, sending money, asking for help, saying hi and good morning on Facebook. So many good questions. Um, there's a question from much earlier. Um, if this attendee is still here, thank you for being so patient. Um, it was, it looks like there's some padding between your head in the billum in the pictures. Um, what is that made of? You're correct. <laughs> so you're, you're absolutely right. So when you're carrying something very heavy, go to the exhibit and try to lift the firewood. You'll see it really pulls into your head, especially if you're not used to it. And so um, people fold up a cloth or a towel, they get leaves or some other kind of like, you know, bush material and they fold it up. So the, I think in that picture, the green, it's green stuff, it's leaves and it's folded up. And then you put it between the, the heavy strap and your head and that protects you. These are good questions. I think we might be at time. I just want to say one thing before I just let Catherine close. Um, the answers that each of you gave about like what you learned, I'm so happy to hear all of those things. You learned what more, more than I could have hoped. And it's been so fun and such a privilege for me to work with each one of you. Yeah, definitely. And um, Lise, are you going to teach this again? <laughs> because I think you should. <laughs> I don't think I could do that more than once, once a decade. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine it took a lot. <laughs> but um, I, I, I mean, I can see the, the result from it, which is really fantastic. So congratulations to all of you. I mean, really job really well done. Yeah. 
So um, with that, I think um, we'll close this out. And um, thank you, everybody, for um, joining us and hearing about this wonderful exhibition. Go and see the exhibition in Brooks Hall if you can touch things. Yeah. Will we put the recording somewhere? Yeah, um, we're recording this. And um, I'm going to put it on the UVA Arts YouTube channel. So I'm going to ask Emma to do that. So it will be accessible after the fact. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.